Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends and lovers of natural dyes, I feel very happy, like all of us, and very honored to, to be in presence in, of such an eminent assembly. And I'm very grateful indeed to the organizers of Indigo Sutra who have invited me to present this keynote address. This was the last slide of my keynote presentation at the World Symposium and Exhibitions on Natural Dyes, organized by UNESCO and the Craft Council of India in Hyderabad in 2006. You recognize the beautiful photos of Jenny balfour -Paul. Some of the persons on this slide have passed away. Some dying traditions have disappeared. Some, fortunately, have survived. And some even thrive, especially in Salvador and Japan which has been gained in the field of natural colorants since that symposium in Hyderabad exactly 11 years ago. I can answer with pleasure much knowledge. The past, indeed, has inspired the future, and tradition inspires innovation. The contribution of archaeological research and science have been considerable. We now understand how unfathomably ancient humankind's knowledge on the art of dying is, how central to cultural identity it has always been, and how elaborate it already appears in the earliest examples, a few hundred years after this beautiful uh, first example of indigo dyeing in the world, I believe. Uh, the Peruvian dyers were already able to manipulate the extraction of the indigo plant and of the vats to the point that they were able to uh, obtain beautiful blues without any rubin or vice versa. They were able to obtain fantastic uh, purples by excluding indigo tin and using exactly 100% uh, indigo rubin. And in the same way, in these uh, Bronze Age textiles, which I am study, um, studying for a few years now, uh, you find the same extraordinary mastership of modern dyes, uh, like these Madder-type dyes. And uh, I am very tempted to brand this civilization, the civilization of the red thread. In the same way, the ancient Mediterranean civilization definitely have revealed themselves as civilization of the true marine purple, with, again, not only the knowledge to obtain <coughs> different shades of purple, but to use them in such elaborate design techniques. Even in regions where environmental conditions rarely permit the conservation of textiles, like subtropical Africa, Recent discoveries now allow to trace the tradition of indigo dyeing on cotton from classical antiquity down to the present. And also, the recent accumulation of ethnobotanical and ethnopharmacological research worldwide has evidenced the connections between the symbolic, medicinal, and coloring powers of many plants and confirmed the essential role of dye plants and dyeing techniques in cultural identities. Such accumulated knowledge doesn't inform us only about the past or about what is preserved today or that we are trying to preserve, but it also opens vast prospects for further research and applications. But this involves a complete paradigm shift from the present era of synthetic dyes. It needs viewing the world of natural colorants as part of a wider green economy in which the monomolecular colorants from black residues of fossil resources could be complemented and uh, maybe replaced, but this is quite uncertain by a rich diversity of the complex colorants elaborated by plants, produced, extracted, and applied using green, environment-friendly processes. But this would need as much or even more intensive research and financial investment 
as those that were necessary to permit the amazingly fast triumph of synthetic dyes. We all know how complex natural colorants are, with their many different components, so many of which remain to be characterized in so many dye plants. On the other hand, this complexity may be a way to distinguish and authentify them against attempts at falsifications, which is an issue which will be addressed during this symposium. The main point I wish to stress is that the better we understand what is going on in a dye plant and in a dye vat or in a dye pot, the better, more efficient use we'll be able to make of these theoretically renewable resources and sustainable processes. The example of indigo is ideal and so will allow us in the following sessions to address all these issues. Many progresses will be reported in the different aspects of the development of natural dyes. From the big scale cultivation of dye plants, of historical importance, and actually the producer of this wood is uh, present with us at the Sutra event now, to the prospects of developing the production of lesser known, lesser exploited dye plants in order to enlarge the offer and present a variety of products representing different cultures with the bonus of possibly finding clues for the development of eco-friendly dyeing processes in the study of traditional dyeing recipes, which is another issue which is going to be explained further in this symposium. As botanical explorations of all kinds of environments progress in the hope of describing them before they are destroyed, we can even expect to discover new natural colorants which will be selected for cultivation and production of colorants extracts from different applications. This is what is going on presently in New Caledonia with this startup recently created by one of my former students as a result of years of collaborative research into the dying potential of the rich endemic flora of the archipelago. Other huge potential mines of new natural colorants are being tapped or can be exploited. These are the buy and waste products of other industries using plants as raw material. Lastly, progress has been made and still can be made to optimize eco-friendly processes of extraction of natural colorants to make their use easier and more economic at the level of both crafts and industrial production. Let me hand this review of progresses made with just one example of successful application of natural currents to non-traditional substrates, meaning the bioplastics. What has not progressed so much, I find, but maybe some participants do not have the same impression, we can discuss it, in the general public's awareness and appreciation of natural dyes. Can look at ourselves in this room, how many of us daily or even often uh, use naturally dyed clothing or use naturally colored objects. This is why I should like to finish this brief introducing remarks, uh, introducing remark, uh, by showing you some examples of current actions taken to get more people, and particularly the young generation, acquainted with the beauty of natural colorants, in order to prepare for a rising tide of colors obtained from nature to compensate for the blackness, bleakness of our time. Thank you very much.